Hello, and welcome to the Computing Conversations column. This column is from the April 2014 issue of IEEE Computer and is titled, Doug Van Howley, Building the NSFNet. There is supporting video material for this column that you can find in the IEEE Computer Society YouTube channel or in the IEEE Digital Library. I'm the editor of the column, and I'm Charles Severance from the University of Michigan. The ARPANET connected ARPA's computers to researchers during the 1970s and 1980s. In the mid-1980s, the National Science Foundation decided to deploy shared supercomputing resources at several universities around the country. It connected those centers with a TCP/IP network that would eventually become known as the NSFNet and later evolve to be the public Internet. Doug Van Howling was the University of Michigan CIO back in the 1980s and was instrumental in bringing together several partners to craft the grant that greatly broadened the NSFNet. He was also involved in guiding the project through 1995. In the mid-1980s, the NSF issued a request for proposals from universities to host supercomputer centers, and the University of Michigan was one of many that wanted in. However, the inclusion of a Japanese-built IBM 370-compatible computer in its proposal was a risk because it turned out that the U.S. government wasn't inclined to spend scarce research dollars purchasing major computing equipment from a company outside the U.S. I had gotten to know, not well, but had gotten to know Eric Block, who was then director of the National Science Foundation. Um, and uh, Eric and I had a conversation about Michigan's proposal. It was clear to me from my conversation with Eric that there was no prospect that the Michigan proposal would be funded. I said to Eric, I said, well, it occurs to me that what might be even better for the University of Michigan than having a supercomputing center is to run the network that connects all of the supercomputing centers together. Although Merritt wasn't deeply involved in the early ARPANET project, it had extensive experience in packet switch networks and had helped operate a 56 kilobit TCP IP NSF funded network that initially connected the five supercomputer centers starting in 1986. The team at Merritt wanted to keep the budget for the project under $15 million to make sure the proposal was financially attractive to the NSF. Merritt started looking for partners who would be willing to contribute hardware, software, services, and money to expand the project's scope without expanding the project's budget. Van Howling had a friend named Al Weiss who worked at IBM Research. I had an old friend uh, who worked for IBM Research by the name of Al Weiss, um, who's in charge of all of IBM Research's computing facilities. And I called Al and I said, Al, uh, this is a great opportunity, but IBM is going to uh, is is not going to be successful here, and um, I need your help. And so Al sort of rallied some folks from IBM Research, where there actually was work going on in TCP/IP pro protocols. We got tentatively an agreement from IBM that they would contribute the hardware and the software uh, to create the routing uh, uh, structure for the network. Continuing to work through his IBM contacts, Van Howling was introduced to former IBM employee named Dick Liebhaber, who was then the CTO and Chief Network Operations Officer for MCI. Together, they approached MCI to donate the communication lines for the project. At that time, MCI was this fledgling organization. Some people had described it really as, as, a, as a law office uh, trying to create uh, an environment where they could actually offer telecommunication services up against AT&T's lobbying efforts. And they, they had just been successful in that. They were establishing uh, uh, facilities across the United States. And, uh, and Dick Liebhaber saw this as an opportunity to sort of move MCI into the big time. With IBM providing the hardware and software and MCI providing the connectivity, Van Holling also got a commitment of a million dollars per year from the state of Michigan. So we wound up being able to submit a proposal to the National Science Foundation, I think for something like $14.7 million, because we knew the ceiling was 15. But in fact, by including all this in-kind uh, activity, it was actually more like a uh, $55 million uh, proposal. It was designed to start at T1, um, or 1.5 megabits, uh, with planned upgrades over the over the period of the network uh, network's life. With an unlikely set of partners and large in-kind contributions, the University of Michigan Merit Network offering 
was quite different from the rest of the proposals to build the NSF net. We've subsequently learned that uh, the proposal was received with considerable skepticism by the reviewers at the National Science Foundation. Uh, people really wondered about our technical ability to pull this off, but uh, they, that review was conducted without um, uh, reference to the actual funding pattern. And then when the wraps got pulled off of the amount of resource that was being committed by the partners to this proposal, it immediately went to the top of the list uh, at the NSF. And, and a, a short period later, we received uh, informal word that they wanted to negotiate with us about sort of working this all out. But once the proposal was awarded, Merit, IBM, and MCI needed to deliver on their promises. But we had to do a lot of innovation. Uh, the border gateway protocols had to be developed to allow uh, multiple networks to interact with one another. Um, uh, and we had to build increasingly more capable routing and communications facilities. When we started the network, um, we had T1 circuits, but there were no cards for computers that would go at one and a half megabits. We used the T1 circuits, we subdivided, and built a mesh network among all of the routers uh, that we put in place. Um, it wasn't for about a year, IBM was actually to build prototype cards that would go at one and a half uh, megabits. When we, put those, when we put those cards in our test network, we discovered they, they work just fine. When we put them in the production network, the network started failing on us. And we discovered after, uh, after a very tough period that the folks who had built the T1 hardware for MCI had planned on using certain bit patterns to do diagnosis on the network. And it never anticipated the notion that anybody would ever use a full one and a half megabits as a single channel, they had always thought that it would be broken up into a set of voice uh, circuits at 64 kilobits each. And so they didn't have any worry about these patterns ever appearing on their network. Well, it turned out that that happened uh, with some frequency. Over the first few years of the NSFNet, these technical details got worked out, and the network started to take off as regional networks and campuses were connected. By 1990, the T1 circuits were filling up, so it was time to move to DS3, 45 megabit connections. This would require entirely new router software and hardware technologies to be developed. Around 1990, this network was growing so fast that it was clear that these T1 circuits were not going to, uh, were not going to enable what we needed to do. So we had to go to the next step, which was uh, DS3, or from one and a half megabits to 45 megabits which was a very large step, a 30-fold increase in capacity. And in order to do that, um, we uh, wound up creating another uh, not-for-profit organization called Advanced Network and Services. Merritt was still the principal investigator on the grant, but it subcontracted uh, the development of uh, this new network, this 45 uh, megabit network, to Advanced Network and Services, which was headquartered in Normock. IBM, MCI, and uh, Nortel who, uh, all contributed $3 million to the founding of this new uh, organization. So it had the, uh, the staff and the uh, facilities to do the innovation that required us to go up to uh, 45 megabits. Once the NSF net was upgraded to 45 megabit communication links, it had enough bandwidth to handle traffic growth for the life of the project. But as the 1990s progressed, there was increasing pressure to move management and operation of the national internet to the private sector. The NSF net was the fastest internet uh, uh, network um, to the end. Um, it finally uh, was decommissioned in 1995 when the Congress decided that the federal government should not be in the business of supporting something that by that time, uh, in their view, uh, should have been uh, become a commercial facility. I'll not ever forget 
sitting in uh, a House hearing room in the Capitol next to Mitch Kapoor and some small internet company uh, startup CEOs who were complaining uh, to the <coughs> Congress that it was inappropriate for uh, the NSF net to be funded by, uh, by the National Science Foundation when they could provide this service uh, as a commercial service. At the very same time they were making that complaint, they were using NSFNet as uh, their uh, backup network uh, to carry traffic uh, when their uh, much less reliable networks failed on a national scale. As Merit, MCI, and IBM transitioned away from daily operations and maintenance, they were still in possession of the world's fastest and most reliable router technologies. MCI used its experience and reputation to quickly become a successful national backbone network provider. IBM had to decide if it wanted to evolve its market-leading routing hardware and software into a commercial product. In a classic um, uh, innovator's curse moment, uh, IBM, who was at that time the leader in routing technology for uh, Internet backbones, managed to decide uh, that they should kill uh, all of the work they had done in developing these routers because it would threaten uh, their proprietary network uh, efforts. It's probably almost single-handedly responsible for the fact that Cisco became the dominant router uh, company in the United States rather than IBM. Looking back, it's easy to imagine that our current networking environment might have been quite different if the first research-centered national TCPIP backbone had been limited to a $15 million budget between 1985 and 1990. But when the NSFNet award was given to an unlikely group of collaborators, we ended up with a national network that was fast enough for nearly a decade to function as a platform for innovations such as Gopher and the World Wide Web, leading us to shared, free, open, and non-discriminatory global network infrastructure that we enjoy today. This column is from the April 2014 issue of IEEE Computer and is titled, Doug Van Howling, Building the NSFNet. There is supporting video material for this column that you can find in the IEEE Computer Society YouTube channel or in the IEEE Digital Library. I'm the editor of the column, and I'm Charles Severance from the University of Michigan.